Hi. Uh, so I'd like to talk to you about uh, some related topics. They are basically related to evolution uh, and to the formation of specialist species. So namely, we're talking about genetic drift, adaptive radiation, and endemic species. And now, none of these topics are specifically addressed on the APES test. Uh, however, they are so tightly related to some of the other ideas. I think it'd be a really good idea for you to have a, a bigger picture. So I'm going to ask you to, uh, to learn this concept here. All right, so let's just start off with the concept of endemic species. And you should definitely know about endemic species for the test. So an endemic species is one that is only found in one place. It, it, it evolved in a specific set of circumstances, certain niches that are available in only one place. So examples would be like uh, koala bears are only found in Australia. Panda bears are only found in this one part of China. Uh, many, many, many islands are just filled with these endemic species that are found there and nowhere else. Now, endemic species... <coughs> are almost invariably going to be specialist species for reasons that we'll address. Uh, and they have limited uh, aerial extent. So as a consequence, they are easily driven to extinction. So most of the extinctions we find on our planet are endemic species who are specialists and not really able to uh, uh, to move to other habitats because, well, they're isolated in, in, and they're endemic only to one place. So I'll just go through a few examples real quick, just, just to sort of point out. Okay, so we have the giant tortoises of Galapagos, very famous organisms. Uh, they evolved on these islands off the coast of Ecuador. Again, it's a good example of um, <clears throat> island biogeography. And uh, when humans arrived, they brought with them on their ships that, uh, these generalist species like rats and pigs and cows, and those have outcompeted them. And it's been uh, difficult to protect them from extinction as a result of the encroachment of these generalist species. Uh, Australia is just full, for reasons we'll see, of endemic species, uh, the platypus being a really famous one. And the platypus has done well, despite the fact that, that humans have moved in and fragmented the habitats quite a bit. But there's, remember we talked about edge effects and how if you have uh, different areas that are fairly closely connected, species can, can get by, and that's the case with the platypus. Tarsiers, look at that, they're so cute. It's the world's smallest primate. These are found on uh, just a few islands in the Philippine archipelago. So anyway, <clears throat> by endemic species, we mean something that's found in only one place. They're almost always specialist species, and they're very susceptible to, to extinction threats. Uh, okay, and then there's a black and dragon's blood tree that's found on uh, Socotra Island in the Indian Ocean. And it's basically very well adapted to the environment that it finds itself in, which is true for most endemic species. So they are very well adapted to where they are and not to anywhere else. So why is it that we find that islands have a very, very high level of endemism? Most endemic species in the world are found on islands, although they're also found in rainforests and certain isolated mountain areas. Uh, what we find is on islands, we have a very high levels of endemism, but low amounts of species richness. Now, that makes sense because, remember, uh, the farther an island is from shore, uh, the more difficult it is for species to arrive. So you're going to expect to find fewer species. Fewer species means less richness. But of the species that you do find on the island, often they will be unique species to that island. Uh, and it just has to do with the fact that small populations which are found on islands are more susceptible to genetic drift and then that can lead to the formation of new species. I'm not sure why that happened. <laughs> I'll just I'll cancel that. I don't know what that was all about. Okay. Uh, here's a picture of a lemur from Madagascar. All right, so let's talk about this. So what is genetic drift? Okay, genetic drift is not the same thing as natural selection because there's no selective pressure involved. Genetic drift basically happens when you have a fairly small population. If some unforeseen uh, event occurs that kills off a, 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 a large fraction of the population, it can significantly change the relative abundance of certain alleles or traits, or genes that are present in the population. So this is a great uh, little example here. So let's say I have a five to five ratio of, of red bugs to blue bugs. Some unforeseen event happens, smack. Okay, it could be a lightning strike, it could be a, a drought, it could be a disease, whatever. But th the point is, it's not that the red bugs were were adapted to survive. It's just that these blue bugs happen to be unlucky. And after this event, 
there was now a five to one ratio. So as they begin to reproduce, look what happens. I end up with this overwhelming number of red bugs versus blue bugs. And over time, this can lead to speciation. And now we have a new species that's there because just because the population that was small encountered, encountered some sort of crisis that crisis let that certain genes more prevalent in the gene pool and they became expressed over time. And so, so that we find that the, it is the small populations on islands that tends to to lead to speciation and endemism so just keep in mind that, that, that this is not because there is selective pressure like there would be with natural selection necessarily genetic drift just means there was a reduction in the total number of genes in there and the ones that did not get removed become more prevalent uh, but not, that's not that's not uh Okay, so obviously there are selective pressures that are going to happen on islands just like there are everywhere else. It's just that that speciation can happen quicker with these smaller populations. So on the early days of an island's colonization, when the, when the, when the, the population of organisms is small, that's when genetic drift is more likely to, to occur. And the reason is a small population is more likely to have the proportions of genes altered because as the population gets larger, that lightning strike, that landslide, that flood, whatever, it, it, it's going to, to leave a larger pool. Like if there's a large population, there'll be a larger pool of genes uh, that are less likely to be significantly changed by that event. But when it's a small population, those few that survived happen to have a different set of genes, and then those things become really prevalent. And this leads to a thing called, sometimes called the bottleneck effect or the founder effect. And there have definitely been questions about this on previous APES tests. So let's just get into this one here. So <clears throat> the bottleneck effect, which is also called the founder effect, like the founder is the, the, the species that first arrived at the island. When, so the idea is the population being small. So what happens is this. I start off, let's just say I have a large population size. Uh, and in that large population, there's going to be quite a bit of uh, genetic biodiversity. Now, some event occurs that causes the population to drop significantly. Like we said, it could be a landslide, drought, disease, whatever, okay? Now, what happens is, after this, we have greatly limited the amount of genetic variation. Now, the population can begin to increase after this event, but we don't have the genes. You know, it takes a while, it takes a long time for random mutations uh, to result in, in new genes becoming available to this population. So the genetic variation in the population does not necessarily recover at the same rate that the population does. So here's a good example of I see this bottle here. It's got a random uh, yellow and blues in here. It looks like maybe a little bit more yellows than blues. Now, we just let a few things out. In other words, it's just a, let's just say these are the few survivors, okay? Of these few survivors, by random chance, genetic drift, I had a few more blue ones than yellow ones. The proportion here is not the same as the proportion here by random chance. Now, as these ones reproduce, I end up with a population that has a lot more blue genes expressed rather than yellow ones. So, so basically, the bottleneck effect is the basically genetic drift causing an increase in certain genotypes in a population. Now, <clears throat> Uh, again, it's going to happen mostly when, when the population is low. And now this can also lead to a, a condition called inbreeding, which you've probably heard of. Inbreeding basically means that uh, that there are alleles, variations of genes. You know, we all have two alleles for each trait. And, and if you have a defective allele, generally a negative one, uh, usually you have a, a, a healthy one that will be expressed in its place. So as a result, that, that bad one doesn't get expressed. A classic example would be uh, hemophilia in humans, okay? Now what happens is, in inbreeding, uh, there's just not that many healthy alleles around, so when the in individuals breed, there's a higher likelihood that they will have those two copies of that bad allele. So what we find is, in small populations, we tend to get inbreeding, which, which causes uh, unhealthiness. The, it, basically, the prevalence of certain genetic disorders uh, and, and with the founder effect, that can become very widespread in the population. So <clears throat> here's an example. Uh, uh, the cheetahs of Africa. We don't know exactly what happened, but about 12,000 years ago, based on genetic evidence, some kind of bottleneck occurred, some reduction in population that left just a, a few numbers of them alive. They began to, to repopulate, but there's very limited genetic variability, just like we saw back here. Okay, There's, there, there's very little in a way, I point out a very little uh, genetic variability, even though the cheetah species have come back up, uh, cheetah's population, I should say. 
But it turns out, if it, when we sample cheetahs today, we find that that they ha- are so similar in their genetic makeup that you can literally take uh, the liver out of this one and put it in this one, and it won't get rejected. They're, they're they're almost like they're all like almost not quite twins, but like close relatives of each other. Uh, and one of the one of the consequences there's definitely some inbreeding, and so uh, it turns out one of the defects the defects we find is that the male cheetahs have very little. Sp- sperm count, which makes it hard for the species to maintain its, its population. Other examples of inbreeding uh, and expression of these weird alleles is like the Habsburg chin. You know, if you look at these paintings, it's not that the artist was bad. It's just that that uh, people in, in Europe had a tendency to only marry within their own families. And as a consequence, weird genes became expressed. And so there was a change in the, 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 the physical traits, the, the, the uh, phenotype of the, of the people in those families. Uh, another one is is, is uh, 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 porphyria, uh, like uh, King George was famous for that, or uh, uh, hemophilia. A lot of these people had uh, uh, a blood disorder that made them bleed. Uh, here's a weird one. In in Kentucky, there's these guys. This is true. Like you look at this, you think, might think it's fake, but the blue men of Kentucky, they basically had uh, – they moved to this, this very remote part of Kentucky – and the bottleneck effect happened. There were just a few guys there, a few women there, and this one genetic defect was prevalent in uh, the population, and it became dominant in this one part of Kentucky, a very remote part of Kentucky. <clears throat> so basically, low genetic biodiversity uh, often leads to pretty significant changes in the way a species presents itself. Now, adaptive radiation is kind of linked to this. So, so. Adaptive radiation basically means that you have unfilled niches and an organism arrives and genetic drift is going to occur. And because there's these unfilled niches, now we have a combination of genetic drift and selective pressure. Since there's a small number of organisms that arrive on an island and this island has these unfilled niches, what we're going to find is that that, uh, they're going to adapt to to these new species that are going to uh, uh, arise that will fill each of these niches because of a combination of genetic drift and selective pressure so uh, for instance uh, all of the all of the life we find on earth now that are mammals they come back to one little uh, in, in insectivore this kind of nothing animal that lived uh, 70 million years ago and what happened was i think my next slide does this yeah so what happened was basically a comet hit the earth and it wiped out all the dinosaurs who were the dominant species who who had already adapted to all the niches so there just really wasn't much available the only niche that was available was for this little thing to eat bugs that was one that was available to it but now suddenly the dinosaurs are gone all these niches are there and then adaptive radiation occurs the genetic drift in this in this organism led it to fill all the various niches that you have. Uh, uh, so basically, they became uh, carnivore, you know, like cats and bats and and ant eaters and elephants and and whales and all that. They all came about because there was this opportunity to fill niches, and we call that adaptive radiation. So here's a great. Uh, uh, see if I can make this go away. Oh, I can't. Oh, darn. Okay. I don't know if you can see this. You might have to look at the other slide. But basically, here's mammals. And you see they had such a small slice of of the, of the what would I say, the, the small bit, small niche that they could occupy. Okay. And what happened was at the Cretaceous tertiary boundary, the dinosaurs died off. And what happened was the mammals started filling all these niches, as did birds. Uh, crocodiles, not so much, but birds did too. Uh, and that happened as a result of genetic drift and adaptive radiation. Uh, so we find islands have a high rate of endemism because what happens is when a, an island is colonized, there's niches available and genetic drift and, uh, will allow adaptive radiation to cause natural selection to basically invent new species to fill these niches. That is why islands are so filled with species found only on those islands. Uh, so, for instance, in Hawaii, Hawaii was like 100% almost endemic species when humans arrived. Now, that's no longer the case because we introduced generalist species and we altered the habitat, and that caused a, a lot of extinctions because these endemic species don't do well with change. Uh, we also find that endem- endemism is also uh, found 
to a large extent in tropical rainforests. And this is very different from what you find on an island because uh, in a rainforest, we don't have this limitation of, of population size. Instead, what we have is just these very, very stable environment where these sub niches can be found. So, so over time, genetic change occurs in such a way to make species fit these sub niches and to move towards symbiosis. So they evolve in such a way that they have a special relationship with another organism that becomes their niche. Their niche is to have a unique relationship with another organism. So what we find in tropical rainforests is a lot of endemism, but it's, it's there not because of the initial limited size and consequent adaptive radiation, but just because you have a very, very stable, enduring environment in which sub niches can be uh, uh, actualized through through uh, natural selection towards mutualism. Okay, so that's that's endemism and and adaptive radiation. Again, I wouldn't spend a whole lot of time worrying about this, but it is helpful to have an understanding of it because it will help you answer some of the questions about uh, uh, endemic species, specialist species, uh, and extinction.